All right, we continue now to talk more about Abdi and uh, all these young people that are finding a way now to uh, get their education. Uh, he spoke about the difficulties uh, for his family with housing, uh, but not only housing, I mean language issues as well. But talk about that and what these, uh, a lot of these young people are, are dealing with and trying to find uh, their next step in life, not only dealing with what could be homelessness and housing issues, but again, uh, cultural issues as well. Yeah, that's very common um, in the student population that we serve. We have both, you know, families struggling with homelessness as well as individual students who are no longer with their families trying to find a place. And um, it's, you know, from a from our perspective, um, we we know we can't solve all these problems as a school. So what we do we partner with um, agencies to do it. We're very close partners with Youth Care, and Youth Care leads King County really in serving, um, serving homeless youth. And then we also partner with um, University District Youth Center, which is um, further north near the university, but it, we have a school site there too, and they also specialize in um, really working with youth who are looking for permanent housing. We also, you know, beyond that, we partner with different um, cultural agencies and organizations that can help us better understand and also connect to um, the families of students like Abdi. Right. It's, there's a language issue as well as cultural understanding as well. Talk, talk a bit about that and, and how you're bridging that gap to help these kids. I guess if we get stuck, there's always a specialist. It's just a matter of us doing the research and finding a specialist and we have to make it urgent because even if it's one day that we, that we wait out of a 180 day school year, well that's one day the kid might miss that we don't understand. So we just, we do use any resource we can to find hopefully a professional, qualified person who can help us with a language barrier, a barrier that we do not understand, a cultural barrier, we get information, move on. And even one day where you might even lose the young person yes. because right. they give up. It's, it's that much of a you know that thin line it's life or death we really do we we use the analogy of being the icu you know where you are in in that triage mode you're trying to figure out exactly what the next thing is and you can't wait i mean if the student disappears for a day we have to begin immediately tracking them down because you're right they may lose we may lose them and they lose hope quickly uh, in those situations. You know, it's funny though, what Abdi did, what he talked about, he talked about how he would translate for his mom, right. you know, and, and clearly not tell the truth. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I think we've all had experiences where we've thought, oh, they can just tell their parent this. And, and you know, I mean, we've, we've learned over time that that's certainly not the best way to do it. And we do rely on others, others that know um, the language. We can't know all the languages our students right. speak. Uh, and so we, we are good at finding resources. And particularly in a place like the Seattle School District where there are just uh, yes. so many different languages that uh, right. where the young people come into school. Uh, uh, Karin, you earlier this year, you wrote uh, in the Seattle Times, there was a letter that you'd sent in there. And I want to read a little bit of it. I believe deeply in the power of individuals to change and the role education can play in this metamorphosis. I've seen it happen. I guess, you know, people talk about how the juvenile justice system is really, um, is depressing and it's really sad and, and I would agree with those things. However, I guess for me, we also have the juvenile detention school and um, I sort of see these moments in time where, where kids are really struggling, where they hit the bottom as a moment where you can really um, have an honest conversation and begin to plan with them their way out. Every student who walks across the stage at our graduation is number one, first generation high school graduate in their family. Number two, have, has, has been through some sort of real perceived failure in the school system along the way that usually has something much greater attached to it. So the, the graduation means so much more because they've overcome so much to get there. I think that because we figured out how to be, how to really, you know, meet the needs of each individual student. I mean, we're certainly not perfect, don't get me wrong. We're still learning, but, you know, with being able to have the flexibility with the online learning and being able to let kids really work at their own pace. You really want to do this this fast? Okay, then let's pace it out. You need to finish a class every eight days, whatever the case may be. And, and students understand that. And then they, once they have small success, I mean, I think for our students, we set small measurable goals and then they're able to jump from there. And make those big goals. You knew Delana, didn't you, before? Yes, I, I knew her when she was at YEP. So seeing her success. 
I was pleasantly shocked <laughs> by the video that I saw of Elena because, as she said, sometimes she is a distraction, and she had some rough moments at YEP. But we met with her mom, met with, of course, the lead teachers at YEP, and took some time. Once again, when is that internal motivation perk up? We never know. But it perked up, and she took ownership, and the next thing you know, she was the queen of doing online classes. Wow. Miss Debbie would say, I can get assignments late at night on a Saturday, 4 o'clock on a Sunday. She's doing online work because she has to submit it to the teachers. Yeah. And then, yeah, and it's, it's amazing how she took ownership of everything in her life. I take it that when um, these graduation ceremonies happen, that you are like the families mm -hmm. in feeling like these are your kids and seeing them yeah. succeed. It's overwhelming, actually. I, the first time, it, we've both been at interagency for two years. The first year, when I stood up on the stage and I had to welcome the whole group, I was so emotionally uh, affected by it that I couldn't speak. I mean, I looked at the students and I just felt like, these are my kids. I can't, I mean, I'm just, I can believe they're here, but I'm, I'm just so amazed and proud. And, and I mean, we really have an incredible staff that will do anything to help the kids get to that place. I present to you the Interagency Academy Class of 2012. Karn and Anthony, thank you very much again for being here. We appreciate it. And uh, good luck with your work and good luck to these young people in finding their way and getting their education. And thank you for watching this edition of School Beat. We'll see you next time. I'm Enrique Cerna.